Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent. This mailbag is a little bit different. Everything is already more or less unpackaged. The reason for that is that for this mailbag I use goods which have different sources. I got it from China but also from Germany and from the Netherlands. Let's start with the first one. These are the new ESP8285 modules from IT Studio. They are extremely small, but they have a more or less full-blown ESP8266 on board. The ESP8285 has the full functionality of the ESP8266 plus a built-in flash memory of one uh, megabyte. So it is much, much smaller and it has no antenna. It has only an antenna uh, connector on it. Very neat and very cheap also, but not easy to solder. So this is for embedded systems where you build something and you want an ESP8266 on it. Perfect fit. The next one is related to the ESP8266. It is a RT9013 voltage regulator. Now why is this different to our normal 3-pin voltage regulators? I discovered it on the VMOS boards. The VMOS do not have a normal voltage regulator. They have a 5-pin voltage regulator here. And I discovered that these voltage regulators are much better for the current spikes. So I ordered some of them. They are from RichTech and they have to be mounted on a PCB. So with these voltage regulators I hope that I do not need a big capacitor and still have a very good resistance to unwanted reboots. The next is a whole series. The whole series is around LoRa, a new standard for low energy, low volume communication. So let's start with the first one. This is a low pi and low pi as well as the YPI comes from a company, a startup company in the Netherlands called PICOM. They develop ESP32 boards which are not programmed with the Arduino IDE but with a high level programming language Python. So inside here is an ESP32. It has Bluetooth, it has Wi-Fi and it has a LoRa modem. So I can now attach here, for example, sensors or something and they will broadcast their readings to the air. Here I need an antenna. This is why I have this antenna here. The whole thing is in Europe on 868 megahertz. In other areas uh, of the world it is uh, 915 megahertz. Currently commercial networks are built, but of course they are expensive. And this is why some amateurs started to build their own LoRa network. It is free of charge because it is built by enthusiasts like me, for example. This is why I have the second part here. This is a part of a LoRa gateway, a so-called concentrator. It is mounted fixed on my roof and it has 10 channels. And the communication goes from the sensor module here, which has only one channel. It connects then to the concentrator and the concentrator is connected to the internet. The distance between these modules can be quite big. I was in a meeting last week and there one of the guys told me that his record is 61 kilometers. So between two modules like that, 61 kilometers, which is completely different to Wi-Fi. The concentrator is built by a German company and with this adapter board it comes to a Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi has then the necessary software and is connected to the internet. In the near future you will see 
videos about this LoRa standard because it seems to be very important for the moment. Everybody talks about this LoRa standard, so we should at least know what it is. This is the architecture of this international free LoRa network. It consists of four parts. Part number one are the sensors, the sensor nodes which send information to the gateway. Both we saw this was this was the low pi and this was the concentrator which is one part of the gateway. One gateway can support up to 1000 nodes because the nodes usually only send about 1% of their time. The gateway is then connected to the internet and in the internet we have a whole bunch of different applications which run there but important for us is we are connected with our application also to the internet and we can then get the data. So if we have a value measured here, the whole value is transported usually with, for example, via MQTT to our application. And we can do something here, either log it or do something. And then we can even send a command back to our node. And I'm also interested in how easy it is to program a device with Python because the ESP32 will have much more resources than the ESP8266 or even an Arduino. So we might be able to step up also with the programming language and leave C++ behind us for certain applications. I'm really curious how this will work. The next two have also to do with communication. These are the, the well-known A6 modules, but if you look very close, you see this one has a camera attached. So this camera is attached to this A6C chip and we can take a picture here and then directly send it via the GSM network. Neat! I'm curious if this works and how the quality is and how long the transmission goes for one of these pictures. The next one is a normal A6 module. It is more or less a development port. Here you can connect your headphones if you want. You have an SD card, you have a serial adapter and you have also two different kind of antenna uh, connectors. This development board is more or less a replacement of this board here. And you remember I never was really successful to use the display here and the keyboards. It didn't work for me. So this is now quite neat. Small one. It doesn't have the things which do not work on this one. So I'm curious how this works. And I also have to pay attention how these two connectors are connected, whether we have to do something if we want to use this one or that one. The next one has also to do with the A7 module. If you remember, I discovered that the GPS antenna which come with the A7 module are not prepared for the frequency of the GPS global positioning system, which is at about uh, 1500 megahertz. Now these are antennas which are made particularly for this frequency band. This is a small one and this is a bigger one. Now one difference is also important. They have different connectors. This one is a quite a common one, the bigger one. The smaller one is not very common. So pay attention if you buy them that you get the right connector. The next two do not have too much to do with our normal topics, it has to do with smartphones. Now I still have an old Apple uh, 5S, iPhone 5S, and I have to replace the battery. But you see here, this one says it has 2.6 ampere hour, and I do not trust these kind of things uh, from China. The normal battery capacity is about 1.5 ampere hour. I do not believe that the same size of the battery with a similar technology has nearly double the capacity. This is why I want to check it and I want to check that it has at least 1500 milliampere hours and this is why I bought this small 
device and this is just a PCB with all the different connectors of the different iPhone generations. So these are all very special connectors and you just plug them in like that and the, the indicator lights up it means that some life is in the battery and then you use these two connectors here and load it completely just as a normal LiPo battery. Afterwards you take these two and connect it to your electronic load do a capacity test. Very simple thing, very cheap device and you are sure before you build your battery in to your iPhone that it has the desired capacity. Now I tested this battery and it does not have this 2680 milliampere hours it has roughly the 1500 milliampere hours which also the original battery has. So basically this print is a fake but the battery as such is okay. So this was the today's mailbag. It was a little bit different than usual and I hope that you will see these devices in one of my future videos. So this is a little bit the forecast of what could happen on the channel. I hope this episode was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye!